So let's restart the class. So just about three students handed in their uh, assignment at the break time after we already gave the correct answers. Okay? So those students cannot get the full marks. If all their answers are correct, I've made a note on their page. Okay? So uh, they were, I sent the students around, they were asked to hand in their assignment at the start of the class. So, uh, then we're going to move from the risk on the debt to the risk on the equity, okay? So, uh, <coughs> we're talking about default risk with uh, the cost of debt. Okay, default risk means the chances that the company is going to default won't pay back their loan. For the equity risk we're talking about our stock price. Okay? If we lend money to the company, in the risk we're talking about is default risk. The risk that the company does not pay back the money we owe them. Okay? But if we, let, if we, if we buy stock in a company, we have another type of risk. The stock price can go up or down. Okay? So, Discuss this question with your partner. Equity risk, we're talking about stock price or buying some private equity in the company. Is equity risk always higher than default risk? In other words, should the cost of equity always be more expensive than the cost of debt? What do you think? Discuss with your partner. So we're on starting the chapter four in the book. So this is you just have to think. Right, just think. What do you think? Is the equity risk always higher than default risk? Or not always higher. So discuss with your partner. So you lend money to the company, you have default risk. Company defaults, don't pay back your loan, right? You buy a part of the company, you have equity risk. The value of your ownership of the company can go up or down, okay? So hands up, who thinks yes, equity risk is always higher than default risk? Who thinks no, it's not always higher? Okay, why do you say no? Hmm? You're laughing, you don't know? Why do you guys say yes? You read it in the book? Okay, that's a good reason. Any other reason? Huh? Okay, so look. If, if the company, let's just give the case, the worst case for debt, right? Is we have default. What happens when the company defaults? Okay, let's say the company is going bankrupt. Do you understand bankrupt? So what happens when a company goes bankrupt? Stockholders lose almost everything. Who gets paid back the money first? When we're bankrupt, we have to sell everything. Okay, we're going to sell the land. We're going to sell the factory. Okay, sell our trademark if somebody wants to buy it. Okay, sell the land and the factory. We'll get some money. Okay, who gets the money? Okay, the bondholders get paid the money, not not the the lenders get paid this money first. Okay, it means they have the first claim or the priority. Okay, the bondholders have the first claim. Only if there's some money left over, we pay back all of the loans 
and then we still have some money left, then the stockholders will get some money back. Okay? Does that make sense? The owners of the company can't get any money back unless they pay back the people they got a loan from first. Okay? So first we have to pay back the loans we got by selling everything. Okay? Then after that, we might get back some money. So which is riskier? Which one is riskier? Equity or, or debt? Equity. Equity is riskier, right? Debt, fair enough. The worst case for debt is the company defaults. You lose your money. You're still going to get some money back. Some, you won't get all of your money back, but you'll get some money back. Stockholder can lose everything. So even in defaults, the equity is riskier. Okay? Then just generally, generally, uh, we buy the stock, okay? The stock, okay, the stock price. Stock price goes up and down and up and down and up and down, okay? The bond, bond, we just get paid the same. Same all the time, okay? The same, the same interest rate, same, more or less the same price as the bond, unless the company defaults. The company defaults, bondholder loses money. But even in that case, the stockholder is in a worse situation. Okay? So the stock equity risk is always higher than default risk. Okay? Do you understand? So it's always going to be more expensive for the company to fund itself with equity than with debt. Because these people are going to want a higher return on their investment. This person will be happy with 3% or 4%, okay? This person is not happy with 3 or 4%. The risk is too high, okay? So we want 8%, 9%. So the company has to give returns of 8 or 9% to these people, either by paying dividends or by making profits and growing and increasing the stock price. So equity holders have the danger of losing their money, even if the firm doesn't fail. If the firm performs badly, the stock price falls, the stockholder can lose their money. Okay? If the firm declares bankruptcy, the equity holders can lose everything. So we can see equity risk is higher, always higher, than default risk. So the equity risk perceived by the investor is the amount it costs the company to reward the investor for investing in the company. So the company looks at this comp an investor looks at this company and says, oh, very risky. Okay? I want a high reward. Okay? So then the company needs to give a high reward to the investor. The more risk they have, the more reward they have to give to the investor. And it's decided by the perception of the investor. What does the investor think? Okay? So the investor will expect returns which are equivalent to the risk they are prepared to take. Okay? So you start a new company. How much profit are you going to make next year in your company? How much profit do you expect to make? What percent? Just give me a percent. What kind of company would you like to start? Is it a company? Anything. What kind of company would you, could you start? <laughs> Hmm? Chicken chip, he says, right? So you start chicken chip. How much money, how much profit are you going to make next year in percent? Eight hmm? percent? So now I have to think. I can invest in the Coca-Cola bonds in the US and I can get three or four percent. Or I can invest, buy some equity, buy some ownership, give you some money, to start your chicken chip, and I'm joint owner. What would you do? Be joint owner. She says she can give you eight percent, or or buy a bond in Coca Cola for three or four percent. Really? Okay. I'm going to invest in Coca Cola, right? I'm sure. I'm sure I'll get back three or four percent next year with Coca Cola, right? But she expects to get an 8% profit, but I'm not so sure, it's risky. Maybe she'll lose money. 
What if she does a really bad job at the chicken chip and she loses 50%? Then I lost 50% of our money, right? I gave her $20,000 and I say, how's my $20,000 doing, right? And she says, well, we lost a lot of money last year, so now you only have $10,000, right? So that's an equity investment, okay? Maybe I'll lend her some money. Lend her money might be safer, but I still, if I'm lending you money, I'm going to ask you for 9% or 10%, right? Because Coca-Cola would give me 3 or 4%. And I think you have much higher default risk than Coca-Cola. Do you understand? So even lending our money is going to be, I won't accept 8%. Okay? I want more than 8%. Okay? Just an example. So that's just an example that we have to think. Okay? The, as I'm an investor, I have to think. What is the risk? Okay? So maybe you tell me you're going to make 20% next year. And I look at your business plan and I think that's real. Yes, she has a good business plan. She did all her numbers. I believe she will make 20% profit next year. Right? Possibility. So then maybe, yes, now I'll invest. Okay? I think I can get 20% with you or 4% from Coca-Cola. I'll take the risk. I know I can lose money if I invest in your company. But 20% opportunity is worth the risk. Do you understand? So we have to to think in our heads. That's what investors do. So that's how much it costs the company. You're going to have to pay me 20% at the end of the year, right? So it costs you 20% to get equity from me. So if after analyzing a stock or a company, the investors decide they cannot make this return, so I don't think I can make 20%, then I'm not going to invest in your company. I'm not going to buy your stock, okay? So then you need, <laughs> to consider those things. So the main, uh, we have a mathematical model we can use which can help us to decide about what return, what's the expected return, okay, in any business. So the three things we use is the risk-free rate, first of all. We don't start from zero, right? I have to think about the US government bond can give me 2%, right? So I start with the risk-free rate, okay? When I'm comparing your company, I don't start from zero. I can get 2% of the US government bond, okay? Uh, we're going to, to put in the risk of investing in the market portfolio. Okay, we talked about the market portfolio before. So stocks is riskier than bonds. So how much more risky is the market portfolio than the US government bond, right? Let's put in a number here, 4%, okay? That's general number that we can calculate, okay? And then the number we're most interested in is going to be the relationship of the individual's firm performance with the market portfolio performance and the variance of the market portfolio. This is called a beta. So the beta means, is your company adding more risk or less risk to the market portfolio? We talked about that briefly before, okay? If I invest in Gucci, do you understand Gucci? Do you think Gucci is riskier or less risky than the market portfolio? Gucci? More risky or less risky than holding a stock in every company? So if I look at the market portfolio, market portfolio we're going to talk about again is we own a stock in every company, in the electricity company, in the food company, in the IT company, very well diversified, okay? So the market portfolio is moving like this. In 2008, there was a crisis, right? So all of the stocks went down, okay? Market portfolio. The market portfolio is growing again. What does Gucci stock look like? What does Gucci stock look like? More risky or less risky? More risky, Gucci, okay? Gucci is? We have a crash. People stop buying handbags. Okay? Gucci stock price goes down here. Okay, the economy starts recovering, doing very well. Okay, we're in a boom. Everybody's buying handbags. Yay. Okay? So Gucci is going to be right more risky than the market. So it's going to be a higher number here, right? Let's say 10%. So Gucci is going to be 16% total. Okay? 
Let's take another example. Let's say that we talked about before computer video game companies. Okay, what about the video game company when there's an economic crash? What's happening to the stock price of the video game company? Increasing. <coughs> what about when the economy, everybody's working really hard, working overtime, a lot of overtime? What's happening to the video game company stock? Goes down again. Okay? So this one is taking away risk from the market portfolio. This is going to be quite low risk, right? So it's going to be 7%. Okay? So this capital asset pricing model is assuming we are a diversified investor who's investing in, in a lot of different stocks. Okay? And we want to know how risky is this stock for us? Okay? This stock is very risky for us. Adds a lot of risk to our current investment. Gucci. This stock is not risky for us. Takes away risk from our current investment. Video game company. Okay? Then they will have the different risk or different cost of equity. So that's just a very... We're going to talk about this in... This is just an overview, right? Just the introduction. We're going to talk about each thing in more detail. So the equation is expected return is going to be the risk-free rate plus beta times the risk premium. So we can also call this the hurdle rate. Hurdle is something that we need to get over. Okay? So just like when I'm investing in your company, we, I call that the hurdle rate. My hurdle rate for your company is 20%. Okay? I figured out about your company, I put in all the risk, and I figured out 20% is my hurdle rate. If your profit is less than 20%, I'm not investing in your company. Okay? If your profit is over the hurdle, then yes, we can invest in your company. We can get over the hurdle. Do you understand hurdle? Does anybody do hurdling? Do you do hurdling? No? Are you an athlete? No? Last Friday, some students were doing some sports. No? I was an MT. So, <coughs> this is a hurdle that projects have to cross before being deemed acceptable. The hurdle will be higher for riskier projects than safer projects. So the hurdle rate is another way of saying expected return. Expected return, the return or the profit we want to get back. We can also call this hurdle rate. So it's the riskless rate plus some premium. Premium means extra. Okay? Risk premium means extra, extra risk. Right? So the risk-free rate, US government bond, plus extra risk for your company. If you want, you can write down in your book extra risk. But the reason I did it, I write risk premium instead of extra risk, as extra risk is easier English. But in the real life, people say risk premium. Okay? So we should remember that. Use that one. Okay, so we have two basic questions. The first one is how do we measure risk? How are we going to measure this extra risk for a company? And then the second one is, how can we translate this risk into percentage? How can we translate the risk into a number for any company? So, first of all, we have to think about the risk. So we have to think about whose risk? Whose risk are we talking about? The risk from whose eyes? So we're going to talk about the risk from the eyes of the marginal investor. Marginal investor means the investor most likely to be trading stock at a specific time point in time. Okay? So who is buying and selling the stock? Who is the person trading the stock? So we're not worried about investors who are not trading the stocks. Okay? Because they're not the people who's making the price. The people who's making the price is the people trading, buying and selling. So <coughs> The capital asset pricing model uses variance of actual returns around an expected return as a measure of risk. So we already discussed about that, variance of actual returns around an expected return. We gave the example of the oil company, okay, and the US government bonds. And also it says that some of the variance can be diversified in a way, but some of the 
variants cannot be diversified. So, if we look at this graph here, we can see we have two different investments here. Low variance investment and high variance investment. Okay? So, we can look at the difference between actual and expected returns on any stock. So, we, we talked about before, we have the oil company. Right? The oil company is looking for oil, very risky. Okay? So, we expect next year 50% return. We expect. Okay? But, is that going to happen? Okay? If we look at the last five years, we can see that the returns for this company, one year, minus 50. Okay? Year one, year two, plus 150. Year two, they found new oil under the sea, under the ocean, okay? Yay, 150, okay? Year three, didn't find any oil, minus 40%, okay? Year four, found oil again, 200%. Year five, no oil, minus 80%, okay? So, these are the kind of returns on this oil company. So, we expect every year, we say we expect to get a 50% return. Because it's so risky, we have to ask for a high return. So, we ask for a 50% return every year. Some years we lose a lot of money, some years we get a lot of money. Okay? So, if we look at this, expected return is here. We can get, this is a high variance investment. We can have more returns out here at a hot plus 150. More returns out here at minus 150. Okay, the variance is higher. Then we can have a low variance investment. Like a low variance investment is going to be what kind what kind of company did we discuss in the class before that's not that risky? What kind of company is not risky? Electricity. Who provides the electricity in Korea? Hmm? Han John? So we can have Han John. <laughs> so Hanjong Electric Company. What's our expected returns? Expected returns every year we'll say ten percent. Okay? Do you think the that's fairly regular? Are we going to see minus fifty percent next year? With the electric company? No, it's going to be nine percent. Year two, good year, twelve percent. Right? Year three, eight percent. Year four, ten percent. Year five, ten percent. Okay? So we expected to get ten percent, and our actual returns were very similar. Okay? So if we look at this, it's a low variance investment. Expected return is here is ten percent. Most of our time, it's either here at nine percent or here at eleven percent. Okay? It's a low variance investment. So this is one way of looking at risk. Okay? as variance of expected returns around the actual return. Okay? We have an expected return, then did we have high variance? We expect the return to be here, but a lot of times it's out here and over here. Then it's risky. Okay? We expect 10% return and most of the time it's around 10%. Okay? Just very rarely it's out here. That's a low variance investment, low risk investment. So, this is Microsoft, okay? So, this is the stock price changing in Microsoft. So, this is going up and going down and going up and going down, okay? So, we can make a graph like this, get all the data of Microsoft stock price, okay? And see what's happening. Here is 2001. Here is 2013, okay? So, in 2001, there was a month where it went down by 30%. 2001, the IT crisis, okay? But that's the only time Microsoft has gone down by 30%. Okay, we can see here, rebound, one year it went up by 40%. Okay? So, around this time, Microsoft was quite risky. 2001, 2003, one year down 30%, next year up 40%, okay? But we can see that if we look over the long period of time, Microsoft may not be that risky. We're talking about 
here, 20% down to 20% up, okay? Within that band. So we can do that with any company. We can look at their past returns, right? Down 20%, up 20%. What's the maximum that the stock price is changing? And we can get an idea of how risky the company is. Do you think that's okay? Looking at the history? Do you think that's okay looking at the history? Do you think that Microsoft is going to be like this most of the time? You, the maximum you might go down is 20%? No? You think it might go back to here again? Maybe. So then, it depends on your idea. If you don't like that, you're going to use data of the last 20 years, the last 30 years, the last 40 years, right? Different have people like use data for different time limits, okay? Some people will say, no, Microsoft has changed a lot. The company, the business has changed, okay? Since this time. So we're just going to use from here, okay? So this is just again, giving us an idea of risk as variance. Do you understand variance? Variance means difference. Difference, changing. Does the stock price change a lot or doesn't change a lot? Stock price changes a lot, you're a risky company. Stock price doesn't change a lot, you're not a risky company. Okay? That idea. So let's discuss about this question. Assume you have to pick between two investments. They have the same expected return of 15%. And the same standard deviation, standard deviation is a way of measuring the change of the variance, okay? So in the past, they have the same, standard deviation is the difference from the average, right? So they have the same variance and the same expected return. However, investment A's highest possible return is 400%, and investment B's highest possible return is 60%. Okay, so would you be indifferent, don't care? because they have the same expected return and standard deviation. Would you prefer investment A because you have a higher payoff? It's a possibility, there's a possibility you could get 400%. Or do you prefer investment B because it's safer? So discuss with your partner. Choose A, B or C. Okay, so uh, who would choose A? Hands up. Company Yes. Who would choose B? Who would choose C? Oh, yes, last one is C. Should say C here. Who would choose C? Okay, so do it again. Who would choose this one? B. Who would choose this one? C. Okay, so that's normal. Most people would choose C. Because if it has a 400% expected return, it also means the risk. You could lose all your money, right? 
Could you lose 400% of your money? Could you lose 400% of your money? Maximum you can lose is 100%, right? But you can lose, uh, this means that the risk is higher here. So most people prefer the safer one, okay? But actually, this is, according to this idea of risk, it's the same, because the standard deviation or the variance is the same, right? It just happens there's the possibility, so it may be that this one, more often, it has a higher possibility, but more often it's closer to its expected return, okay? So, we can choose any of these. Any of these is okay, but this is just psychology. People prefer to, if they're given the choice, even if the company has the same return and the same variance, they prefer that they don't have that small chance of losing a lot of money. Okay? So, uh, we're going to discuss again the importance of diversification. <coughs> so, we can look at the book on page, uh, Sources of Risk on page 44 to follow. So, we have different types of risk. The first one is project risk. Okay? So, project risk is here. So, this is firm specific, it means it's in the company. The project may do better or worse than expected. So, an example of this is, do you know the new Batman and Superman movie? What company made that movie? DC Comics. Okay, so DC Comics maybe has a lot of different business. It sells comics, it sells movies, maybe it has TV programs. Okay? Batman and Superman is just one project. Okay? So we have this project risk means nobody goes to watch Batman and Superman, right? They say, oh, we're tired of the hero movies. Of course Superman is going to win in the end. Batman is going to win in the end. We already know what's going to happen, okay? So we're not going to go and watch the movie. So the project fails, okay? Can the company diversify this risk? Can that risk be diversified? What do you think? One project within a company. Is the company going to fail because the Superman and Batman movie didn't go well? company is bankrupt? No. Oh, so did they diversify the risk? Yes. How did they diversify the risk? <coughs> they are going to make a Justice League movie. They are making the Justice League movie. Maybe that will do well, right? Other diversification? They have a comic industry. They sell comics. Okay? So, project risk is one right type of risk within the company, but the company can diversify the risk. Try to divert, we can diversify this risk. Okay? So the firm can reduce this risk by investing in lots of projects. Investors, investors can reduce this risk by investing in different companies. Okay? If I'm an investor, I don't just invest in DC Comics, right? I invest in DC Comics and uh, Han John, okay? and the oil company, and someone else. So DC Comics has a bad year, I'm diversified. The next risk is competition, competition risk. On page 45, we can see the competitive risk, okay? So, competitive risk means the competition might be stronger than we thought, thought okay? So we release Batman and Superman, but some other movie decides to release another movie at the same time, we get a surprise, okay? Oh no, they decide to re release, like, Titanic or something like that, right? Really big movie, so everybody goes to watch Titanic, and nobody goes to watch Batman and Superman. So, uh, we have this kind of competitive risk, so, the company can try to diversify by uh, trying to Again, do different types of businesses or acquire their competitors, right? Buy their competitors. Uh, Microsoft, fam famous tactic of Microsoft, Facebook are also trying to use this tactic. Microsoft has any competitors, they just buy them, right? Give them a high price. Go, go away, right? 
In Europe, Microsoft was in trouble for anti-competitive behaviour. They had to pay a, a large fine. Facebook also tried to buy Instagram. The guy from Instagram said that very early, Mark Zuckerberg visited him and tried to buy his company. Okay? And he could have got a lot of money. He could have got billions of dollars and just walked away and lived on the Pacific Island for the rest of his life. But he didn't want to. So he wanted to, he thought Instagram could be successful, so he continued. Okay? So uh, then, uh, again, the investors can diversify across. I can buy stock in DC Comics and Disney, okay? And the other movie makers, okay? Warner Brothers, and so on. If I buy stocks in all those companies, I can diversify the risk. Next risk is the entire sector. So we can see here number three, industry risk. Okay? So <clears throat> the whole industry can be positively or negatively effect affected. So we can look at the book here on page 45. We can see A, we have technology risk. For example, the invention of the DVD technology finished the DVD player. Okay? So that whole industry is finished now. Okay? Did you used to have VHS player? Do you remember VHS player? Do you still have? Put in the video. Are you going to buy one next year? No? No, they're finished. VHS maker. Do you know Polaroid? Polaroid the camera? Yeah, the digital camera came along. Polaroid was very popular before, right? Massive global company. Digital camera came along. Polaroid didn't change their business because they didn't make any money off the camera, they only made money from selling the film. Do you understand film? Yeah. So they said, we don't, even though they made a digital camera, they didn't want to do it, because they said it wasn't profitable enough. And then they were too slow, and then they were bankrupt. Finished. Okay? So that whole kind of industry can be affected by the technology. Uh, regulation risk, part D, B. For example, new regulation on the environment can cause large costs for industries that use a lot of water or emit much CO2, such as the coal industry. So we put a special tax on water, or increase the price of water by double. Coal industry or power plant industry use a lot of water to cool down things. Then they get a big effect. Okay? So some regulation, new law regulation on the whole industry, the whole industry can be affected. Okay? And commodity risk. So for example, the price of oil increases sharply. So airlines are very dependent on the price of oil, the travel industry. Okay, transport companies, shipping, uh, truck companies, very dependent on oil. Price of oil goes up, all of this sector is affected. Okay? We saw recently a terrorist attack in Europe. What what sector is affected by the terrorist attacks? Traveling, right? All the stocks in the hotel companies go down. Hilton Hotels, okay? 4%, 5% after the terrorist attack. So we have that kind of industry risk for the entire sector. So then the question is, how does this relate to diversification? So the, what can a company do? A company can diversify across sectors, right? Like Samsung. What kind of businesses does Samsung have? Electronics, finance, hmm, finance like insurance. insurance, clothes, do they make clothes? Cars. I saw they made some cars, okay, maybe Samsung might be involved in travel, okay, so they have a problem with the travel industry, is it a big problem for Samsung as a company, are they going bankrupt? No, no right, why, they diversified across the different sectors, okay. Investors can do the same thing. I'm an investor. I can buy stocks in different industries, not just in one industry. Okay, I should at least six. We should be investing in at least six different industries to get the benefit. Okay, we just diversifying two or three. It's not enough benefit. We don't really need to invest in in 50 industries. We can get almost the same benefit as investing in six industries as investing in 50 industries. Not much difference. But there's a big difference between investing in three industries and investing in six industries, right? That's statistics. So, 
you should, if you're investing or advising somebody about investing, advise them to invest in at least six industries. So IT, okay? Travel, food, electronics, cars, clothes, okay? Choose six different industries. Okay, uh, then the next one is exchange rate and political risk. So we call that country risk in number four here, okay? So a firm's profits can be affected by a crisis in a country. For example, due to the politics. So we have the Ukraine or Greece recently had some problems. Okay, then of course the company's profits is going to go down. So again, the company can diversify across countries. Okay? Another risk in the country is the currency gets very strong or the labor cost goes up a lot. Okay? So let's say that I, these days Samsung, they have a factory in China. Labor cost is going up. The Chinese currency was getting very strong. Okay? So they diversify across countries. They move to the Philippines. Okay? They set up a factory in the Philippines. They set up a factory in Vietnam. Okay? The Japanese companies, Toyota and Hyundai, they had, they had that problem with the US dollar before. So what did they do? They found that the Japanese yen was getting very strong against the dollar, so nobody in the US was buying their cars. What do you suggest they should do? They stop selling cars in America. Just stop selling cars in America? Give up? Go home and watch TV? Hmm? In what country? Their problem is that the yen is getting very strong against the US dollar. So in what country are they going to set up the manufacturing? They are currently manufacturing in Japan, but Japanese currency is very strong. The Japanese car is very expensive in the US. Okay? So what did, did Toyota do? Where did they set up a manufacturing plant? They already have in their home country, that's the problem. They have the manufacturing plant in Japan, and the Japanese currency is very strong. Do you understand the problem with a strong currency for exporters? Do exporters like a strong currency? Why not? Their products are more expensive in other countries. Okay, because they have to, they pay their salaries in Japanese yen. They pay all the money in Japanese yen. Okay? So they are going to have to get a certain amount of Japanese yen when they change their dollars to yen. So they have to charge a certain amount of dollars. If the yen is very strong, they can't reduce the dollar price. Right? The dollar price just keeps getting higher. So what do you suggest to do? Take factories to America or Canada. Yes, they set up the factories in America. Okay? Set up some manufacturing in America. So now the US dollar gets very weak. We get the advantage of the weak dollar, right? We can at least manufacture some cars in the US where the dollar is very weak and sell in the US. Okay? So we can diversify, the company can diversify across countries. Go to different countries, not just one country. If we are in one country and the country has a big problem, then we could have a problem. What about investors? That's easier for investors than companies, right? It's not that easy for companies. Companies also, for their, for their revenues, is important, not just manufacturing, right? McDonald's is very diversified. McDonald's gets revenues from 150, 160 countries, okay? If there's an economic crisis in Korea, is McDonald's worried? No, they, have, they sell in a lot of other countries, right? But imagine you're a Chinese company, and your only customer is in Korea, and Korea has an economic crisis. Are you worried? Yes. Yes, that company can't buy from you anymore, you're in trouble. Okay? So also we need to get the revenues from different countries, diversifying that way for the company. But that's harder for companies, it's easier for investors. Okay? Investors can, we looked at the down Gumion, right? Investors can buy a fund in the S&P 500, they can buy a fund in Japan, they can buy a fund in China, they can buy a fund in another country, okay? So if the Korea has a crisis, I invested all my money in Korean stocks, maybe I'm going to start buying, okay? But I invested my money in the US, in South America, in Japan, in other countries, then I'm not going to start crying. It's not that big difference. Okay? That's just, again, we talked about here six different industries. 
We should invest in six different countries or six different areas of the world to get good benefit from diversification. And countries that are not correlated. Okay? For example, Australia is not that well correlated with the US. So if we invest in the US and Canada, it's not that good diversification. They're not they're too correlated. So then uh, the last one then is the market risk. So we can look at the book, we can see that uh, this one is the one we can't diversify. Okay? This is macroeconomic factors that affect almost all firms and all projects. For example, changes in interest rates, or changes in the risk-free rate, or changes in the real interest rate. Okay? Investors are risk on, investors are risk off. Okay? It affects all the companies in the market, making it more costly or less costly to get money. Okay? So other factors that affect all investors include the risk preferences of investments. Investors, risk on or risk off, inflation, economic growth, world economic growth. Okay? Neither investors nor firms can diversify against this again away this risk. Okay, so when we're talking about the market portfolio, the market when we invest in the market portfolio, we invest in stocks all over the world in every industry. So are we worried about this risk, project risk? If I invest in every stock in the world, every company in the world, am I worried about project risk? Am I worried about competition risk? Am I worried about industry risk? Am I worried about country risk? No. Am I worried about market risk? Yes. Yes. So the market risk is basically what we're talking about with the market portfolio. Okay. If we invest in the market portfolio, how much is the risk of the market portfolio? Okay. Is the market portfolio very risky or not very risky? We can't diversify that risk. Things that affect that include, right? Economic, world economic growth. World economic growth is good. Market portfolio is going up. Okay? World economic growth is not good. Market portfolio is going down. We can't avoid this. We can't avoid this going down. Okay? Like the risk free rate. The US interest rates are important. The interest rate on the dollar affects all everybody. Okay? Uh, investors. We saw the psychological problems for investors. Okay? Investors are risk off. But all, every investment might be going down. Okay? Just generally, invest, invest, there's a global crisis or investors feel risk off. So this is kind of risk we can't diversify. Okay? So this is the risk that we will be using as the extra risk of stocks versus bonds. Okay? Because we are going to assume that our investors are diversified investors. Okay? And they invest in the market portfolio we're going to assume. Okay? Most investors are diversified investors. Okay? You do get some investors who just buy one stock in one company. But that's not most investors. Most investors are diversified investors. Okay? So they're investing in a kind of market portfolio. So we're going to see how much more risky is the market portfolio compared to the risk-free rate. Right? How much of a premium do we have to add in for the market portfolio? And that's what we will be talking about uh, with the risk premium. So, uh, do you know the Financial Times newspaper? Financial Times is the main newspaper in the UK. So, I want you to tell me the type of risk. Type of risk that we're talking about here on the headline. Okay? Look at some headlines here. Okay, first headline Argentina nears return to debt markets. What kind of risk is that dealing with? Country risk. Okay, country risk of Argentina. So our, we already explained about Argentina. They didn't pay back their debts. So now Argentina is rated CCC, one of the worst rating. Don't lend money to Argentina. But now it's coming back. It's coming back to the debt markets. It's starting to pay back its loans and come back. Okay? 370 billion of deals aborted on Obama's watch. Corporate America dismayed by the government moves to block takeovers. 
So the government is bringing in some regulation to stop companies from buying other companies. They're blocking companies from getting too big. What kind of risk is that? Industrial. Industrial risk, right? Regulation on the industry risk. Okay? Deutsche Bank chairman denies pressure to leave. Maybe the chairperson of Deutsche Bank is going to leave. What kind of risk is that? Hmm? Competitive. If you're a competitor of Deutsche Bank, yes, but that's just generally firm risk. Just one firm, right? Just that risk is, if the Deutsche, we saw when Steve Jobs left his job as Apple, the stock price in Apple went down, okay? Sometimes they think the chairperson or the CEO is very talented, then they leave, it's firm risk, okay? Uh, asylum claims pile up in Greece. So a lot of migrants are coming to Greece. What kind of risk is that? Country risk for Greece, okay? Or your regional risk for Europe, for the EU, okay? So Japan lashes out against the rise of yen. The yen is getting stronger. Japan is not happy. What kind of risk is that? Country risk, okay? We talked about that the yen, okay? So we can look down through all of these headlines and see, you can practice looking at the headlines yourself, what kind of risk is it, okay? So then do you have any question about what we discussed today? The main types of risks and which ones we can diversify and which ones we can't? No? Then let's finish there for today. So make sure that you check your name on the list. Where is the attendance list? It's there. Yes? The midterm exam is going to be on uh, Friday the 22nd. Oh yes, uh, so let's have a show of hands. You have a choice about the midterm exam. It can be on Friday the 22nd of April or Friday the 29th of April. Which do you prefer? Hands up who says 22nd of April? Hands up who says 29th of April? 29th of April. 